Hi everyone, welcome to week five of Computer Science 225. This week we're going to learn a version control system or VCS called Git. Now a version control system is a type of software that ch tracks the changes that are made to a software project as it's being worked on and as it's being developed. So with a version control system, you can do things like go back and look at past versions of the code. Uh, this is super helpful just in and of itself. Um, if you've been working as a programmer for any amount of time, you've probably had the experience of making some change to your program and then later on realizing like, um, I wish I could go back to the way it was before. You sort of regret the change and, and want to sort of undo it. Well, a version control system lets you do that. It lets you sort of go back and forth between different versions that you've worked on. Version control systems also will let you work with other people. So if you have multiple programmers working on a project together, it sort of takes the changes that everybody's making and manages them together so that it, uh, if there's no conflicts, it merges them together. And if there are conflicts, then it, it sort of identifies them to you and, and lets you decide how you want to proceed. So version control systems are pretty much universally used in software development. Uh, it greatly simplifies the process of working on a project like this. Um, they also let you recover a file if you accidentally delete it or corrupt it. And so for you all, that's a nice benefit as well of using a version control system. Like I said, they're pretty much universally used. There's lots of different version control systems and uh, some are more or less popular. They all generally work along the same basic principles of sort of tracking the changes incrementally of a project as it goes along. When I was a student, the most popular one was Subversion. Now the most popular one is called Git, and so that's the one we're going to learn. Now Git, incidentally, was created originally by Linus Torvalds, who's the same person that originally created the Linux operating system, which is the flavor of Unix that's installed on the CPSC server. So Git is the tool that we're going to use, but like I said, the same principles apply generally to other version control systems. Now, in addition to Git, there's something else called GitHub, which you may have heard of. Um, GitHub is sort of a website that lets you host Git projects. So sometimes people conflate the two things and think Git and GitHub are like the same thing, but really they're not. Git is the tool that actually does the version control. And GitHub is a website that lets you host Git projects and sort of distribute them to the wider internet. In uh, week, uh, I think it is 13 maybe, we're going to be talking about using GitHub to create a project that you can then share with other people. But this week we're just going to be talking about the Git version control system itself, how you use it to manage a project, and how you can use it to track the changes as you're working on something. So let's pull up a terminal and we can get started working on this. So here I have a terminal logged into the CPSC server. What I'm going to do is first uh, tell Git something about myself because, like I said, one of the primary uses of Git is it allows multiple people to work together and sort of share code back and forth. And so in order for that to work, Git needs to know who is making the different changes. And so when we use Git, it's going to want to know our name and our email address. And so we can tell them with this git config command. And now git sort of has this like sub command system. So all of the commands for git are going to start with git. And then what we want git to do is going to be sort of like the second word of the command. So in this case, we're going to say git config, which will make a configuration change, um, basically save an option to the git program. All right, we're also going to put the global flag on there. And what that does is it makes it so all Git projects for our entire user are going to use the same settings, as opposed to setting this setting just for like a specific project. So when we use Git, we'll set username equal to our name. This way, Git knows who we are. And we'll also set our uh, email address as well with a similar command git config dash dash global user.email and I'll put in my UMW email address for this. So what this does basically is it makes a hidden file. Hidden files, if you remember, are those that start with a dot in our home directory and git can just look at this file if it ever needs to know who we are. So alternatively, you could have just wrote these words into this file called dot git config in your home directory 
but the git config command just puts them in there with sort of the right syntax. There's a few other git configs that we can do. Um, since we're talking about it now, we can just sort of do them all together. Um, I uh, think this might be the default, but uh, I'm going to set it so that it uses Vim as the uh, editor. We'll um, see that when we uh, commit changes with Git, it'll let us sort of like type in a little message saying what has been changed. And uh, I'll tell it that I want to use Vim as my editor for typing in those messages. Uh, if you use another editor, you can put that instead. But since we did Vim last week, I think it makes sense to do Vim. Likewise, there is a uh, functionality of Git where it lets you sort of see the changes um, side by side between different versions of your program. And so we'll use the tool vimdiff for that, which we'll cover in detail later on in this course. I'm not sure exactly which uh, week. And the same tool can also be used for merging things. We all talk about what, uh, how we use these in a second. But since we're doing uh, the git config command, I thought we would, I would just include all of the configuration settings uh, that make sense to do. There's one more that I suggest that uh, I'll put in now, which is to set this diff tool prompt setting to false. Um, when we look at uh, looking at different versions of the program side by side, which is something that Git does, like I said, uh, by default, it between every single uh, file it shows you, it says, do you want to see this? And uh, prompts you to hit Enter to continue. Uh, every single time, which is super annoying. I don't know why that's the default, but we can turn it off by setting diff tool.prompt equal to false. That way, uh, it'll just show us the differences between the files without asking first if we want to see them, which, like uh, I said, I find kind of uh, unnecessary. So this just puts all of these settings into this .git config uh, file. So if you ever want to go back and change any of those, you can just open that file up directly to change your settings. But now that we've sort of configured Git, the only things that are really necessary, like I said, are your username and your email. Uh, now that we have those settings set up, we can create a Git project. And so for this, I'm going to use these .java files and .csv files that are in this project one directory. This program is just a simple sort of like library management system written in Java where there's some code for keeping track of like what books are in the library and uh, what customers are there and who's checked out what books and stuff like that. Just a little simple program consisting of a few files just so we can sort of play around with this. Now, the way that we will use Git is we will first create what's called a repository. And when we create a repository, that um, sort of is Git's concept of the project. Anything that is uh, in the repositories folder can be tracked with git. And so the way that we do that is we type git init. And now uh, here in 2023, we get this sort of warning message when we get init for the first time. Um, this is caused by um, this sort of controversy or discussion in the git uh, community, I suppose, about what to call the um, starting branch for a project. So we haven't talked about this, and we'll get to this uh, later on in the semester. But another thing you can do with Git is sort of like make different sort of like simultaneous versions of your program that you develop sort of side by side. So for instance, if you're working on a project and you have some idea about a big change you want to make, but it's going to take a while to do, you can make a separate branch is what Git calls it where we sort of develop the main project in one sort of stream of development, one branch. And then we have, you can make other branches for like doing experimental features or things like that so that you can sort of like keep two separate versions of it developed simultaneously. Uh, those are called branches. And uh, by default, you always get one branch, one sort of like main pathway of developing your program, one sort of set of changes from beginning to end. And historically, this has always been called the master branch. That's what it was called when Git was first created. But now uh, there's been some controversy over using this word because it sort of um, has connotations of slavery. Uh, 
essentially. And so uh, there's discussion about changing this word and um, using something like main instead for your main branch. And so if we create a git project now, uh, it'll still use the name master for the branch. Um, but it gives us this sort of warning message saying, this is the default branch name, but it's subject to change. Uh, if you want to configure the initial branch name, you can change it to something else. So this is another git config setting that we'll do. Um, so uh, we, can, we can sort of do that. So I'm going to delete the git repository that it created. And then we'll take git's suggestion and change the name of the default branch. Uh, default branch instead of master. Let's use main as the default branch name. Now, if I clear the screen and list this again, now if we create a new repository, it will just create it now, and it will use the name main instead of master. And so that uh, message you may or may not see depending on when you're using Git. I expect in the future they'll just change it so that all of the starting branches are just called main by default, which is just you know a perfectly good name for it. So um, now we have created our repository. And if we do an ls-a to list all the files, you'll see that there is this new directory that got created, which is called .git. This is where git will store all the information related to your project. You can cd in here and list it. And you can see there's a bunch of stuff in here folders and files and such. But you don't ever mess around with this directly. So I would not go mucking around in the .git folder. You might accidentally screw something up. Um, there's no reason to. All of the commands that we give git will make the necessary changes to that directory. We don't have to go in there and do anything ourselves. So now, if I look at my files, I will, um, by making a git repository here, I've set it up so that these things could be tracked. I could track the changes that I'm going to make to these files. But by default, git doesn't keep track of files unless you specifically tell it to. And you do that with the git add command. So git add will add a file into the git repository so that it can be tracked. So I can add all of the star dot Java files and all of the star.csv files. This is a usage of the wildcards, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. So rather than type out all of these file names to git add one by one, I can just say add all the Java files and all the CSV files. Now I have um, set it up so that they'll be added to the repository and we'll track the changes. The way that that actually happens, though, is with this git commit command. When we do git commit, we make what's called a commit. That's the sort of um, version control uh, term for what I'm going to do. And a commit is basically a, um, a checkpoint or a save point of your project. So like in, uh, in lots of types of video games, when you're playing it, you can't just save whenever, or at least that's true back uh, in the older games that I used to play when I was a kid. Uh, you had to get to a checkpoint, and then it would save your progress up to that point. And then if you continue past that and you die before getting to the next checkpoint, you sort of go back to the previous one. That's how commits work with version control and Git in particular. When you're working on your project, when you want to sort of save the state of it right now, you'll make a commit or a checkpoint or a save point, and that will sort of save everything that you've done so far. It doesn't just continuously track your changes and continuously save everything that you do to it. It only saves it at these discrete commit points. So whenever you call git commit, it will save everything you have so far and keep that version of it sort of safe and accessible. Um, then if you make other changes, you would need to save them again by saying git commit. So when you say git commit, you make those checkpoints. So if I do that, if I type git commit and hit enter, what happens is I'm brought into Vim because I set the editor for git into Vim. Um, then I will be sort of given this initial text in here. And what this is doing is it's asking me to put in some message that is describing this commit. The commit messages should sort of 
succinctly state what has been changed. So you can say like, fixed a bug and describe it, or added a new feature and say what it is. Um, in this case, this is just the initial commit for this project. I didn't have any Git repository here before. I just had a bunch of loose code. So I can go into insert mode and say like, initial commit of library project or something like that. Then when we save and quit, Git will take this message and store it along with all of the files and wrap that up into our commit. So when I save and quit out of here, it has done that. It has, as you can see, um, given us this text with the message I just wrote, initial commit of the project. And it um, tells us about uh, the fact that it has created all of these files. So it added all of these files into the commit for this project into the repository. You can see there's been seven files changed, 289 lines total inserted into the repository. All right, now you'll also notice this number right here. This is what's called a hash, and it is sort of like the ID number for this particular commit. Every time you do your commits, every time you make these checkpoints, Git generates a hash for it, um, which is, again, a unique identifying number that identifies the hash, uh, identifies the commit, rather. So if we want to reference this commit later on, we'll use this number to do that. OK, so let's say I make another change to it. Let me open up one of these files. I'll open up book.java. And uh, let's just say I put in a comment at the beginning of this. I don't really need to um, make a massive change to show you how this is uh, going to work. We can just add a comment into this. And so I'll say something like, the book class represents a single book in our library, something like that. I can save and quit out of here. And now I might want to commit that change. Typically, you'll only want to commit changes that are a little bit more substantial than that. But we can go ahead and make a commit for this just so that we can see how it will work. Now, if I say git commit just like I did before, it actually won't commit the change. It will say, uh, no changes, add it to the commit. And it will tell me that there's a change not staged for commit. And so the way that Git works is um, we have added this file, book.java, into the repository. But when we want to commit changes to it, every single time, we have to tell it what to commit. So there's a few ways that we can do this. We can either git add it again and say git add book.java and then do git commit like that. And then as you can see now, it brought me into Vim to type my commit message and it says that this change is to be committed. So I can add a little uh, commit message saying something like added a comment to the book class and then save and quit out of here. Um, the Reason for this is because Git will allow you to sort of only commit some of the things that have been changed. So let's say you're working on a project and you have five files. And one of them you're in the middle of making a big change to and it's kind of a mess. And then uh, some of the other files you just make little changes to. Git will allow you to commit those little changes while leaving the other one sort of just being worked on. It lets you sort of selectively um, choose what things to make checkpoints of. It doesn't automatically do it for everything. So if I make other changes, like let's say, um, what else do I have? Uh, the customer class. If I open this up and add it a comment as well, saying the customer class represents one library patron, something like that. Uh, and let's say we also give it a uh, default constructor that takes no parameters. And I'll just set name equal to an empty string, customer ID equal to zero, and checked out books equals to a new array list, something like that. Um, then I, again, if I try to just do git commit, it'll say this change hasn't been staged for commit customer.java. Um, let's make another one. Uh, 
so we can have two files just so we can see how this works. I have here the catalog as a CSV file just of a whole bunch of um, books. Uh, let's say I delete one of them and say the kite runner is no longer in here anymore. Now again, if I try to just do git commit, it will tell me that these things are not staged for commit. I've changed these two files, but I haven't told git that I want to add them to the commit. There's another way to do this, which is to call git commit a, which says to add everything to this commit, every file that's been changed since the last time. It won't add brand new files into your repository, but for files that are already in the repository, if they've been changed, it'll automatically add them to the commit. So now when I hit enter, it should bring me into Vim, and it should say that both of these files have been modified. And I can say something like added constructor to customer class and removed book from catalog, something like that. And now I've made that commit as well. There's one last um, flag for git commit that I want to show you. So let's uh, open up one of these things again. Maybe I'll open up um, book.java again and just add another comment here, single library in our book, which can be checked out and or returned. Again, I don't want to make this a programming uh, lesson. We're mostly just talking about Git. So I've just added one line, just a little comment to this, just so that the file has been changed. Well, um, I can add this change into the repository. And now when I do git commit, if I just hit enter here, it'll bring me into Vim to type a commit message. But there's one other way you can use git commit as well, which is to give it the dash m flag and then write your commit message directly onto the command line. So here I can say added another comment to book class, something like that. And then it will just take that commit message and use it for the uh, commit that I've just done. And so here, as you can see, we get another commit that happened. And it just took my comment right on the command line. I didn't have to like, go into Vim and type it in. As you can see, these uh, commits, every time I did one, it generates a new uh, one of these hashes. So every commit gets a unique hash. As you can see, they have numbers and also some letters in there. And that's because they're hexadecimal numbers, which are base 16 numbers, which you learned about in discrete math or will learn about in discrete math. And they consist of the numbers 0 through 9 and also the letters A through F. So these hashes uniquely identify each commit. Now I can see them by typing the git log command. Git log will print all of the changes that have been made to this project in sort of reverse chronological order. So the very first one is the first thing that gets put in. And for each of them, you can see that it gives us the commit hash which is a super long hexadecimal number, in fact. And um, it also has the author, which is why Git needs to know who you are and what your email address is, is so that it can put these into the commits. For now, this will just be one person, just ourself. But like I said later on in this course in week 11, we'll look at how you can use Git to collaborate between multiple people. And so then it'll tell you who did each thing. It gives you a timestamp for each commit, and it also gives us the commit message that we typed in. And so we can see that now we have done four different commits into this project. So now there's different things that we can do with our Git project in addition to sort of keeping track of the commits, keeping track of the checkpoints as we go. One thing is to see the differences between two commits. That can be done with the git diff command, and I can give it two different um, uh, hashes to see the differences between them. So I can see the differences between this commit and this commit by copying and pasting in these hashes and hitting Enter. Now it brings up this kind of interface where it shows you the differences between them. The output of this is sort of a little bit hard to read, maybe, but it uh, highlights in red the things that are in the new version of it that weren't in the old version of it. And so we can sort of uh, scroll up and down in this view with the page up and page down, or the K and J keys to go up and down, just like in Vim. And so you can see that 
the newer version uh, has uh, it's uh, the 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 first one that we put on the command line, which was the newer one, is missing these lines that are in red, and it's added this line that's in green, and so um, you can sort of see the differences between commits that way. There's another way we can do this, which is instead of typing git diff, we can do git diff tool. And also, we don't need these entire uh, lines of the hash. When we're giving git these hashes, these ID numbers, we only need to give it enough digits that makes it unique. So usually, you can get away with just doing four or five digits for this. And so now, if I do this, it brings me up in this program called git vim, uh, right, rather, our, our diff tool which we configured to be vim diff. And so now we're in this version of vim that shows things side by side. And so here we can see the one we included first, which is the newer version over here. And as you can see in this file, we have a constructor here that isn't in the other file. This file goes from line 7 right to line 8. This one, we've added this constructor. And so now there's lines in between here. We can then move on to the other files. Uh, sorry, as we go. Um, sorry, quit out and quit out. Uh, and then when we quit out, it brings us to the other file that's different, which is our catalog.csv. And here you can see the newer one, which is on the left, is missing the Kite Runner book, which uh, I haven't read, incidentally, um, but is in the older version of this because that one was deleted. And so then we can quit out. So git diff tool, I think, is the most convenient way to sort of see the differences between two versions of a program like this. Uh, we'll talk more about the vim diff program in a few weeks when we talk about sort of doing the differences between multiple files, um, which is a really helpful thing. So that's how we can sort of just see the differences between multiple versions of our project with either git diff or git diff tool. There's uh, another really helpful thing with uh, Git, which is that if you accidentally delete one of your files, Git will recover it back for you. So if I accidentally remove library.java, delete it with rm, as we said in week two, there is no recycle bin. And so this file would just be gone. It would just not exist any longer. But with uh, git, because we've been tracking this file, we can ask it to give it the most recent version that's been committed. And you can do that with the git checkout command. So I can say git checkout library.java. And then it gives us this little message. As, as you can see, library.java has been resurrected. It is here again. And if we cat it, we see that it has all the code that was originally inside of this file. So that is how we can do that if you ever need to get a file back that's been deleted. If it's in Git, you can use git checkout to bring it back. So um, we saw that you can use this git diff or git diff tool command to sort of just see the version differences between two things. But something else you can do with git is you can go back in time and go back and bring back the files as they were at a previous commit. And that's done with the git checkout command as well. So if I do my git log again to list all the files that we have, I can call git checkout on any of these versions of them in the past to sort of bring it back to the version that it was at that point. So I can check out this initial version. Again, I don't need the whole thing. I can just check out the first few digits of the hash. I can do git checkout 1071, and that will bring us back to where we were in the initial commit of this project before I made any of these changes here. So it gives us this message talking about this and sort of explaining what we've done. We are in what it calls a detached head state, which is kind of like needlessly morbid sounding. But it means that we're not on like the tip of the branch anymore. So we can't commit and make new changes now. We um, are sort of back in time. And so it gives us options uh, for things that we can do here. We can either make a new branch and break off from this point and go in a new direction, which uh, is a thing that we, we won't do and won't talk about how to do. Or we can just jump back again to the current version, which is, which is what we'll do. But this is really helpful if we want to just sort of poke around on a previous version of our project. It's really helpful if you sort of notice a bug in your program that didn't used to be there. You can go back in time and 
try your program then and see if the bug existed on a particular version before you made different changes. Um, you can also just go back and see how you had things uh, at a certain point of time so that you can then you know, uh, learn from that or maybe uh, decide to undo the change, which is something we'll talk about in a sec. So if we look here, if we open up catalog.csv, it will have this uh, line for the kite runner in because that we got rid of later on. If we open up book.java, it won't have any of these comments at the beginning that we put in there. If we open up, what other changes do we make? In customer.java, we didn't have, we don't have this default constructor anymore. None of the changes that we made to this project during this video are here any longer because we went back to the first commit. We've checked it out. So if we want to go back to the current version, you can always do that by saying git checkout main, main being the name of our main branch, and that will check us out back to the initial version of it. And so you can see that the previous head was at the initial commit, and now we switched back to main. So now if I open up customer.java, it will have this default constructor. And if we open up catalog.csv, that uh, kite runner book is now gone. And so we have updated everything to be the latest version now. Something we might want to do is we might want to just undo one of our commits and uh, totally um, uh, uh, update all the files so that they were the way they were without that commit happening. And so for instance, if we wanted to, let's say, um, undo this commit, the one that added the constructor to the customer class and removed the book from our catalog, we can do that with the git revert command. I can revert on 2966. And what that will do is it will undo just that commit. So uh, notice that we um, can undo one commit, which was before a more recent commit. And that's kind of a cool thing about Git. It doesn't force you to sort of like undo only the most recent thing, which is how like the undo button works in Vim or other text editors and Word and stuff like that. Git will let us uh, undo any of the commits that we've done in the past. So when we revert 2966, it should keep the comments in the book class, but it will get rid of the constructor in the customer class and add back the book we deleted from the catalog file. So when I do this, it will pull us into Vim, uh, asking for us to put a commit message in for this. It gives you sort of a default commit message that says what it's doing. It's reverting the um, message that we put in for the git uh, uh, commit that we are, in fact, reverting. And you can just leave this message. That's usually fine. So we'll save and quit. And now, as you can see, two files were changed. One insertion, because it put the book back into the catalog.csv, and seven deletions, because it took out our uh, customer constructor. So if we open up customer.java, we can see that that's gone. And if we open up catalog.csv, we can see our book is back. And if we open up book.java, we should see that these comments still exist. So even though that happened more recently than the change we just undid, it's still there. Now if we type git log, it will show us that we have um, reverted the constructor to the customer class. So when we do a revert, when we undo a commit, that itself is a commit that just undoes the other one, if that makes sense. So here, uh, this is our most recent commit then, the one that reverted the previous change. Then we have adding the comment to the book class, and then we have added the constructor uh, to the customer class down here and all of our previous ones. Now, if you notice when I type git log, it, uh, it brought me into this little program where I'm paging up and down through it because there was too much text to fit on the screen at once. So if you're in this program, um, the git diff does this as well. This type of program is called a pager, and it lets you sort of just go back and through uh, text that won't fit on your screen all at once. You can use the J and K keys to go up and down. I think you can use the arrow keys too. Yeah, you can. Or you can use page up and page down, um, or space to go down through as well. And if you want to get out of it, you can type Q to quit out. So Q will quit you out of that pager program where we're looking at our log. Now, of course, the nice thing about this uh, undo system using git revert is that you can, if you wanted to, undo your reversion. So if I reverted this commit, it would go back to what the way it was. Um, so when you 
undo in Word. You have the redo option as well. Um, but then if you do something else, then it, it sort of loses it. Um, with uh, Git, you have all of the history throughout the entire project. So if you undo and revert multiple things, it keeps all of it. And so you shouldn't ever really lose any information using Git. You should always be able to go back and find the things that you had done previously. All right, so something else that we'll want to do with Git is tell it to ignore specific files. So for instance, if I was to compile, uh, well, let's talk about Git status first. Git status sort of tells you if you have things that have been changed that haven't been committed yet. So if you type git status uh, and everything's been committed, it'll give you this sort of text. We're on the main branch. There's nothing to commit. The working tree is clean. But if I make a change to one of these files, um, let's say I open up book.java, and uh, let's say I get rid of one of these setters. Uh, we don't necessarily need a set method down here, let's say we deleted this out. Uh, then if I type git status again, it will tell us that one of these files has been changed. Now book.java has been changed. And so git status will sort of tell you if everything's up to date or not. But let's say I actually compile this program and do java c start, uh, oops, I'm sorry, uh, java c star.java. That will, oh shoot. Um, Oh shoot, I guess that method that I just deleted was actually needed. Uh, let me see, I don't think I actually, no, that's fine. We don't need to worry about that. Um, what you can see is that most of these files did compile successfully. Uh, and so I now have these .class files. And so now if I do git status, it will tell me that not only was book.java modified, but also I have these files, book.class, bookstatus.class, and customer.class that should be added into the repository because they're not being tracked. Let me uh, rm book.java and then check out book.java. This is a quick way to sort of just undo changes that you haven't uh, committed yet. So because I made that change where I deleted a method out of book.java, I can just delete it and then get the most recent version back again. And then uh, that set status method should be there. So now I think all of this should probably compile. All right, now when I do that, it'll again sort of tell me that these .class files aren't being tracked. And Git will sort of bug you about that. And every time you do Git status, it'll warn you that these things aren't being tracked. And so we could do one of two things, I guess. One of them is we could add them to the Git repository and commit them. The reason that we don't want to do that, though, is because these .class files are binary files. They're just gibberish. If you try to open them, one of them up, um, it's just binary nonsense in here. You don't actually care about these files, really. They need to be there for us to run the program, but they're just sort of artifacts of the Java compiler. If we delete all these .class files, we can easily get them back just by running Java C to compile them again. There's no real reason that we need to save these in Git. And in fact, they will make things like the Git diff really complicated and cumbersome because it'll say, hey, these two dot class files are different. Look at the differences. But it's just a binary gobbledygook anyway. We don't want to see the differences between them. Um, in general, with Git, you don't generally want to use it to track files that you could easily regenerate. So in this case, the .class files can be easily recreated from the .java files. And so there's no reason to include them in the repository. But Git will warn us all the time that they're not being included in the repository. And so the solution to this is to tell Git to ignore certain files. The way that's done is by opening a file called git ignore. Actually, it's .git ignore, so it's a hidden file. And this file should go just in the same directory as our repository. So not in our home directory, but just in like the project itself. So I'll open up git ignore, dot git ignore in vim. And then this file, the way that it works is you, on each line of it, you um, give a file name or a pattern that uh, indicates files that should be ignored. So if I type book.class here, then it will ignore the file book.class. And any changes made to book.class will just be totally ignored. It won't warn me that it should be in the file or anything like that. So I could list them all out, all the .class files, 
But the better way of doing it is again to use our friend, the wild card, the star, the asterisk, and just say star.class should be ignored. And that will ignore any file that ends in the .class. This way, Java, or rather Git, won't tell us to put them in the repository. It knows they're supposed to be ignored. This file can contain as many lines as you like, each one with a different pattern or file name. So if we also had like a, a database file, like data.db we want it to ignore, we can put that here as well. And you can have some lines containing patterns like this and some with just like straight up file names. For this, though, we just really need star.class. And so we can save and quit out of here. Now, if I do git status again, it will not tell us that these .class files are not part of our project. It knows they're supposed to be ignored. But funny enough, it does tell us that the .git ignore file now is uh, not being tracked. Um, and so uh, usually we will commit this for our project. Usually the project does include the .git ignore as part of the repository. And so we can add it with git add and then commit it with git commit and say we've added a git ignore to ignore class files, something like that. Save and quit. And now when we do git status, it should tell us that we're on the main branch and everything is good to go. All right, so generally the workflow for this as we're working on a project like this is we will make some changes. Um, you'll open up files in Vim or whatever, uh, make changes to the code, add features, hopefully fix bugs, hopefully. And then when you've made a change that you want to save, you'll either do git commit a to commit all the changes that you've made recently, or you'll git add each file that you want to commit and then call git commit to actually go ahead and make the change. This way you'll get the benefits of using uh, git, which like we've said, are that they allow you to go back and forth between previous versions of your code to either just inspect it and sort of like see what was different, what changes have been made, or to check out the past versions of your code so that you can play around with it. Again, like I said, this is helpful if you want to go back and look at how the project used to be structured or go back and run a previous version to see if a particular bug was existing at that point or not. Other benefits are that if you accidentally delete a file, you can easily recover it and get it back again. Also, if you made a change that you later decide was a bad idea, if you tried to fix a bug but it actually made everything worse, then you can revert that change and go back to things the way they used to be. As I said before, we'll revisit Git in a few weeks. I think it's week 11 that we go back and look at Git again. And in that week, we'll talk about how to do the collaboration aspects of Git, where you have multiple people working on a project together. The nice thing about that is it keeps all of the changes in sync and coherent with each other so that you can all work on the project together and it keeps track of all the changes together. It also will help you adjudicate what are called conflicts. So Another thing Git does is if multiple people make um, changes that can't be reconciled, like if you both try to change the same method in different ways, it will identify just those um, small pieces where you've conflicted with each other and ask you which way to fix it. So in week 11, I think it is, we'll talk about GitHub and how to work with multiple people and how to deal with conflicts like that. But even for just right now, using Git is a really helpful thing to be able to do. Um, I've had many, many students over the years come in and say, oh man, I accidentally lost my file or accidentally deleted it or accidentally overwrote it with something else. And I'll ask them, did you have a Git repository for your project? And unfortunately, they usually say no. And then they're just kind of out of luck and have to redo potentially hours of work. Um, sometimes they say yes, and then that's a really good thing because then they can just check out the most recent version. So just having Git, even if you just use it as basically a fancy backup system, it still is really worth using. I myself, if I'm working on something for more than a few hours, I will definitely have it within Git. Um, I also, uh, if I'm working on papers because I write them in Vim, I also put them in Git usually. And so that also allows me to sort of go back and look at past versions and stuff like that. So it's a really powerful tool. Like I said, source control is universally used in the software industry, and Git is the most popular choice um, of version control systems. And so it's definitely worth learning. 
uh, you'll have to learn it if you're a professional software developer. And uh, it's worth learning now because then you can take advantage of the benefits of it while you're still a student. So that's all for this week. Um, if you have any questions about anything, like always, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Thanks.